Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our panel discussion on cloud computing's first economic recession. Let's talk platform efficiency. And uh, let me ask by, uh, start by asking a question. How many of you have uh, a mild efficiency panic at your companies, at your organizations? All right, so you're at the right place. Uh, we are a group of end users, and we also have uh, eff efficiency panic at work. And uh, we've been spending some time uh, doing optimizations and figuring out what's the best way to make the platform efficient. And um, back in the day, it used to be capital expenditure. Like you'd have a data center, the spend was predictable. And these days with the move to cloud, it's a pay-as-you-go model, and it's really uh, becoming a OPEX, operational expense, and impacting uh, companies greatly. So uh, I think that's the reason why we have this and the increased focus on optimizing and squeezing more and doing more uh, with less is the, um, is the mantra these days. So uh, in this talk, we are going to be talking about three aspects. So culture, operations, and design. So these are the three broad categories that we are going to be talking about today. And with that, we'll uh, introduce ourselves uh, and I'll hand it over to Todd to facilitate the panel. Yeah, thanks, Hi. Aparna. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Hello, uh, my name's Phil Whitrock, and I work at Apple on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Nagu, I'm working at Zalando in the cloud infrastructure department. Um, I'm managing two teams, cloud, um, sorry, container platform and cloud cost efficiency teams. My name is Aparna Subramanian. I'm director of production engineering at Shopify and uh, I've been involved in platform efficiency efforts for the past year and a half at Shopify. Hi, I'm Todd Akinstam. I'm principal engineer at Intuit, working in our core systems team. Uh, that also includes our Kubernetes platform. Well, let's get started talking about culture. Obviously, the goal is ultimately to increase efficiency and reduce costs, but you know, where do you really start? What do you, you know, how can you get started? Uh, how can you gain organizational commitment to improve efficiency uh, and reduce the costs. Uh, Phil, you want to yeah, start? Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, so one thing I think is helpful to start with is start out measuring where your big wins are, where do you want to focus, uh, what's going to move the needle a lot but it's going to take a long time to do, what's maybe not going to move it as much but it's very easy to get done. And then from there, figuring out who the right folks to engage with are, what are the right teams uh, so you can start moving forward. Yeah, and I can add to that. So um, this has to be somebody's problem, right? So it ha there has to be uh, some center of excellence or a FinOps practice, and they have to be in charge of making sure that everybody uh, knows that it, it, is a, it is a consideration that they have to worry about. So often we run into uh, the situation where it's everybody's problem, but it's nobody's problem. So I think having the central team is really important. But it's also important to understand that it now suddenly doesn't become only the central team's responsibility for making sure the platform is efficient. It has to be a collaboration between engineering, finance, procurement uh, is, the, is the team uh, that you have probably that is negotiating uh, contracts with your cloud vendor or you know, uh, uh, other vendors. So I think it really has to be a collaboration between all these different teams and that's how you bring about that awareness and accountability. Those are great points and uh, I would like to just add on by saying um, you would like to drive the cost ownership through uh, financial practices as Aparna said. Um, you know, you have to have uh, budgets uh, based on accounts, teams, and business units. Um, you could also bring awareness in terms of how important this cost efficiency efforts are. Um, because most of the times um, we would hear from the business that, you know, delivering a feature is more important because that's going to bring in money um, to, to your company. Um, but you have to sort of equate the cost efficiency with um, your GMV or revenue so that they understand how this impacts the bottom line in the end. Um, and as Phil mentioned, you should also measure everything. 
um, at our company, we kind of have um, a lot of metrics. One of them is kind of looking into um, the resource level, like per vCPU cost or per memory, um, gigabytes of memory cost. Or we also have unit cost based on applications like card or search or things like that. Um, we can also have very higher level metrics um, like connecting the infrastructure cost with your GMV or revenue and then see uh, whether it makes sense um, to invest or, or spend so much. Yeah. yeah great. Thank uh, actually, let me get a share of, uh, show of hands. How many people know what their cloud bill is? Like how much are they spending in the cloud? Okay, that, to me that's the first step, right? You, you need to know, you need to know what you're spending. Um, and you know, the old adage holds true, you can't really manage what you don't measure, right? So you know, first measuring that. Let me see a show of hands. Uh, do you, who knows how much a particular service or application costs? You know, not the whole? Okay, a little, okay, good, good. Uh, so, uh, so I think that, that's the big challenge is taking that cloud cost, that big bill, and attributing it to individual teams, individual applications, uh, because only then when you have that visibility, you know where you have the opportunities to improve. Uh, so at Intuit, we have a, a dev portal where uh, we track all of our different software assets, you know, whether it's a service or an application, and all those have some asset ID and that asset ID is propagated and tagged to all the resources that are required to support that, uh, that service or application. And then we aggregate all the, all the billing data and attribute it based on that. And so that gives us a, a fine grain and be able to put up a number in front of development teams and actually roll that, up, roll that number up to various directors and VPs and, and so forth. Because um, it's not enough to give the top level you know, the CTO or the CEO, the, the bill, right? You need to give that visibility to the people who can actually make decisions and make changes to how the system operates. Yeah, and I'll uh, add that uh, that level of visibility is really the first starting point. When we started, uh, you know, looking into things more closely at Shopify, we were able to see clearly from the cloud bill, you can see which, what are the different projects, what are the different clusters, but, it's, it's not exactly helpful, right? Because if you have a multi-tenanted platform, you want to know how much is app A costing and how much is app B costing. And if you have like shared platforms like database platforms, logging and observability, these are all multi-tenanted systems in its own. So you want to be able to attribute that cost per platform to each app. And I think that's where, you know, then you can drive accountability and go go to that team or go to that director or VP and you know hold them responsible for making the changes necessary to improve the efficiency. Uh, so how else do you guys give visibility of cost to your organizations? Yeah, as, as Todd mentioned, um, tagging is a great way. Um, that's probably the only way to understand um, who owns a particular resource. Um, we also try to attribute the cost at the most atomic level um, like application, and then you can just work backwards to uh, teams and business units and stuff. Um, as Todd mentioned, you cannot manage what you don't measure, uh, and I also believe that uh, you won't get any attention to work on these kind of topics if you don't report on them. Um, so you have to create reports that are catered to specific uh, use cases and users. Um, for engineers, I believe they would like to have some real-time data, anomaly detections and alerts and stuff so that they can react really quick on cost incidents, um, whereas for managers and, and management, they could be more of uh, week or week cost changes or some sort of reports. Um, we also try to sneak this into our ORMs, um, you know, just make it a topic, and then also we have BRMs uh, with our cloud vendors uh, or even within um, the internal business units when they are talking about business review, then um, they talk about the infrastructure costs. Uh, so it gets more visibility so that we can react on them. Yeah, and I'll add that once you have that visibility, uh, it's important to get down to the level of unit cost, right? Because if App A is costing $500, and if I'm a developer in that team, well, great, you know, what do I do with that information? So if it, 
gets translated to, well, now it's like you, for every transaction, it's 50 cents, and now it's 75 cents, then I have, have something to work with and continuously track and improve and optimize. So I think it's uh, once you have this absolute number per application, uh, it, it's very helpful to get down to that unit cost and continue to track that continuously. So one thing I find sometimes we'll get some cost alerts that says, oh, this, this resource is idle. You know, you should go shut it down. But I, you can't always shut idle things down. Can, can you talk a little bit more, uh, Phil, about, you know, what about idle resources and how do you manage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, what optimal efficiency looks like may be surprising, for instance. Um, preemption is very disruptive, right, uh, or can be. And so you may have a workload that's a run to completion workload, not checkpointing. It's uh, you know 50% done or nearly done after running for a while, and then it gets um, preempted because you know you don't have any idle resources and you need to roll something out. And so in that case, like having a bit of headroom so that workload didn't get preempted in the middle of what it was doing may be more efficient, even though your dashboards don't make it look that way. Um, passive, if you have active passive DR, for instance, what does optimal efficiency look like for the passive instance? Is it 100% utilization? Like, probably not. Um, same thing with HA. So the idle resources may be an artifact of like, what are the capabilities of the platform you're running on? What does it offer? And maybe that Slack just needs to be there for your availability needs. Yeah, and I think it's important to know what, what that Slack, uh, good Slack, looks like right so having that common understanding of like efficiency and waste for each application and across these variety of stakeholders that we talked about finops finance engineering teams is really important so uh, i'm curious to hear your take uh, nagu on this uh, so shopify is an e-commerce platform and sometimes we have to reserve and scale up all the way because there's like a big flash sale coming up and that time you don't want to be um, you know, scaled all the way down, and you don't want you know your auto scaler to kick in and your cluster auto scaler to be kicking in and, and doing all of these things. So I think there are these times where you want to protect your reputation, and it's not about uh, efficiency. Yeah. So um, as infrastructure teams, it's sometimes hard for us to understand what the application owners actually want to do, and why they have I don't know primary, secondary, and uh, what are their HI needs. Um, so at Zalanda, what we do is, um, especially in case of uh, uh, flash sales, we have um, we are utilizing um, CRDs um, to sort of pre-scale um, our clusters uh, and also scale down, um, you know, when it is done. So this is really effective for us um, because we can ensure the business continuity and availability. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can also make sure that when things are done, the house is clean. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday is a really big event for Shopify. And that's what we do is we leave it scaled up for a certain period of time because there's Christmas and there's like peak shopping season. But then once uh, we are able to like monitor the traffic uh, that's ha uh, you know c coming to the platform, we uh, the FinOps team uh, pays close attention to make sure that you know things are back to normal. So I think that's why you need that central FinOps team because like there's somebody looking at this every day and reaching out to the appropriate teams to take action. Yeah, I think that's a good segue into our next section uh, of operations. But before we move on, I wanted to also bring up that sometimes there's costs that are difficult to to see or to manage, and one area that's in particular difficult is observability, right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes developers will just emit logs and metrics without really thinking that it, it actually costs money to store those things, and, and that can actually add quite a bit. And then it's also difficult to then attribute those costs back to the biggest offenders of the, you know the biggest loggers who are you know, sort of wasting log space or or emitting too many metrics. But at the same time, there's a cost of not having those logs or not having those metrics if you need to debug or or troubleshoot the, the platform. But yeah, with that, let's move on to operations. So we talked, we talked about uh, Black Friday, also into it, we also have different seasonal type of workloads. We have uh, TurboTax, which is really seasonal around the tax, you know, tax season. Uh, we, we have QuickBooks uh, product where you know, nine to five is very busy and then outside of nine to five is not as busy. 
Uh, so we have a mix of different workloads, and uh, I think uh, because CPU and memory and compute resources is a big component of cost, uh, you need to really see how can you make your clusters and applications uh, run most efficiently to, to minimize costs, but at the same time provide the services that, you're, that you need to. Um, anyone else has some thoughts on, you know, how do you optimize your compute? You know, so you talked about scaling up. How do you actually scale up for Black Friday? Yeah, like uh, like Nagu mentioned, for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, uh, you know, it's all about protecting our, our reputation. So we do scale all the way up um, to the projected uh, traffic, and uh, we actually disable auto scaling for that period of time um, because we don't want the you know the the system churning and like uh, Phil mentioned, you know, preemption and you know all of that is costly uh, to the system. Um, but other times, uh, we do leverage auto scaling. So, um, you know, the auto scaling all the way down, right? So we have HPA that we leverage heavily. And uh, we don't do auto VPA. We use VPA to, uh, we are the platform team, so we, we use VPA to recommend what the right uh, memory and CPU that we think should be. And we make that suggestion to the uh, respective application team using um, Slack channel, we are the automated PRs and things like that. And then it's up to the application team because they know the specifically the nature of their workload. So it's up to them to review the recommendation and make the appropriate changes. Uh, but we leverage HPA, we leverage cluster autoscaler. So um, for all times other than like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, this is the sort of the mode of operation for us. Yeah, so I think auto scaling is is kind of a key uh, capability. If you can auto scale your not only your application but also your cluster, you know, up and down, uh, you know, that's the you know for cost that's obviously the best. But it does come with some disruption. So how can you minimize that disruption? I think a lot of it starts with making sure the apps can be disrupted. Right? You can't you know launch a launch a pod in Kubernetes and expect that pod to live forever. Right? It's uh, that's not the <laughs> that's not the intent of Kubernetes, uh, and there's a uh, for a twelve factor app. There's a concept of disposability, which means that any one instance of the app needs to be capable of terminating and gracefully exiting and and being disposed of at any time. And so when it gets a sig term, when Kubernetes wants to scale down a, a replica, it's going to send a sig term and. Uh, that application needs to gracefully handle that situation, and, and it shouldn't be a big event. But not all not all apps are perfect, and so there are some cases where you want to you know try to avoid that. Uh, but we should always strive to allow that kind of dynamic uh, scaling up and down. Um, what are uh, what are some misconceptions about auto scaling? It seems like kind of like a panacea where, oh yeah, that's just do auto scaling, but. Uh, <laughs> Is it really that easy? <laughs> yeah, I think vertical auto scaling, as you kind of mentioned, Aparna, is a tricky one. Like, what is, does the vertical auto scaler have the context to know the difference between a failover state and a not failover state? Or is it going to see an increase in resource usage due to a failover and say, hey, we need to change the pod spec and start a rollout right, right now? Um, so the, the recommendations. I think uh, there's a lot to be said for checking those in as part of your regular release process. You can roll it back, it's audited, these sorts of things. Um, the, a lot of the metrics, uh, I think, get measured at maybe their averages over intervals, right? Maybe 30 seconds or something like that. And so uh, one thing we've seen is if you measure at a one second interval, like what's the P95 is actually quite a different number. And so, um, that can help with setting your limits and how you think about uh, bursting and these sorts of things. Yeah, um, we also kind of don't recommend VPA uh, for our application owners, but we do use it for our um, cluster components for our singleton applications. Um, we could still use them because it uh, uh, doesn't matter if it has a little bit of a downtime. Um, but when it comes to HPA, we also ask them to be very mindful of um, the thresholds that they are setting, right? The target uh, utilization um, that they have to set and also the min replicas that they have to set um, because sometimes they can be a little bit more generous um, and then during 
uh, non-peak hours, then this is going to cost a lot of money. So we ask them to um, be mindful of those things, uh, even when it comes to HPA. Yeah, maybe let's pause there. Let me. Can I see a show of hands? How many people are using HPA horizontal pod auto scaler or something? You know. Okay, something equivalent. Okay, a lot of people are using that. Uh, what about how many people are using VPA or some mechanism to vertically scale your pods? Okay, a few, a few number, a few uh, less. How many people are using cluster autoscaler? How many are running on-prem? So there's some different challenges between prem and on-prem, or in the cloud and on-prem, but. Uh, a lot of things. A lot of the takeaways are the same uh, for both, uh, because even though on-prem you have to buy servers and rack them, and it takes some time. You can't just order more from your cloud provider. Uh, it turns out that when you're in the cloud, you're probably dealing with reserved instances, and you're you have a you know a certain committed number of servers that uh, or instances you're buying from your cloud provider. So you have a similar kind of capacity planning uh, issue for both cloud and on-prem. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Todd. Oh, sure. um, I know that you've mentioned that in Intuit you have a really nice way to like sort of rotate your clusters every every once in a while. Because the one problem that we've seen at Shopify is, um, you know, with with auto scaling all the way down, including cluster auto scaler, your cluster can sometimes become fragmented, and you can have like you know for lack of a better word, empty pockets of uh, available resources that then, you know, sort of never gets uh, reaped. So, and I know that at Intuit, you have some interesting ways of dealing with it. Yeah, so that's a, that's a bin packing, right? So you, over time, if pods, you know, if you have uh, an application scaling up, scaling down, pods can get scheduled on different nodes. Some nodes could get underutilized and maybe just have only one pod on them, you know, and not really taking full advantage of the resources of the node. Um, there's a project called Descheduler, which would go and actually deschedule pods and, and reschedule them onto uh, another node that and, and you know restore that bin packing. Uh, at Intuit, we actually we terminate our nodes every 25 days or so, uh, regardless, uh, and that's kind of a little bit for security and compliance reasons. Um, but it also has a side effect of forcing, you know, forcing all those applications to get rescheduled and kind of trains our developers that, hey, uh, I can't count on these pods running forever. It's okay that they terminate. It's okay that they come back up. And so by doing that, we've kind of helped build this culture and understanding of how, of how Kubernetes works uh, for the developers. Uh, then we also, for other compliance reasons, we need to update you know the uh, the AMI and the the security patches of all the nodes, and so we'll also, uh, regardless of the the uh, 25 days uh, time period, we'll go through and and rotate all the nodes to update. You know, and so all these various things help reinforce the fact that you need to be able to scale. So that's good for operations, but also that also applies to auto scaling, scaling up, scaling down. Um, yeah, we also. Uh, at Intuit, we're looking into developing a system that takes the recommendations from VPA, taking uh, taking our historical metrics that we're we're collecting for each application, and then using that to make some decisions and recommendations for both VPA and HPA. Uh, typically, you can't run v or you shouldn't run VPA and HPA concurrently in the same cluster. That's they're kind of working at cross purposes for each other. Uh, so we're trying to uh, uh, build a system that imp that integrates those recommendations, and then, as was mentioned, uh, apply those recommendations through the pipeline through using GitOps, so that if you change the resources of a pod, um, that that change in resource will start back in your pre-prod environment, get tested, validate that it, it does work in pre-prod, and work its way through the pipeline. Uh, to your production environment. We don't want to just suddenly change the resources in production uh, without being able to test it first. So that, you know, that's, the, that's the approach that we're taking. Uh, and we've also open sourced uh, NumaLogic and uh, NumaFlow, which is an open source project that it's a machine learning uh, 
and uh, analysis project that runs in the, in the cluster that can take advantage of Prometheus or other uh, types of data available in the cluster to help make those decisions. So we're looking to, to leverage that more going forward. Um, so, uh, let's see. I think, uh, I think we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, so, so the next big area is design. We talked a little bit earlier about designing your, you know, a 12-factor app that allows for disposability, right? So that's one, like almost the, the first key aspect of, of design is making sure that your, uh, your applications are cloud-native and can run on Kubernetes and do tolerate disruptions like that. Uh, but what are some other ideas? What are some other things that uh, impact the architecture, design, or coding of applications uh, that might impact cost and efficiency uh, when architecting and designing your system? Yeah, so when we think of efficiency, people often think that it's all at the infrastructure layer and it's the responsibility of the platform team or the infrastructure team to take care of it. But it truly is a partnership with the application teams as well. So something that uh, Shopify has been working on recently is continuous profiling of applications uh, because you don't want to just tell application developers that, you know, profile your application, make sure it's efficient and optimal at all times. So in order to reduce the friction, we have rolled out this continuous profiling feature where every application is getting profiled continuously at a, at a certain sample rate. And uh, using this, they can, you know, it's, it's sort of very easy for them to go look at, look at their profiles and see what, what their application is doing when. And we've been able to identify uh, opportunities where, um, you know, there's like a, a static list of objects that gets, um, you know, created every time uh, when the process starts up. And if you look at it, it, it may not seem like much, but then if you think about how many processes that you have across your clusters, across your fleet, and how many times it gets uh, executed, it's actually quite a lot of unnecessary CPU cycles. So uh, being able to create such tools and enable the application developers to make the right decision is also a key part of uh, efficiency and optimization. Um, so one of the things that we do at Intuit is whenever we have a new release of our platform, uh, we run it through FMEA testing um, and, but one part of that FMEA testing is running a load test, uh, some known sort of repeatable load test uh, that runs a certain amount of transactions. We, you know, we use Gatling, just kick off a, a bunch of transactions from a bunch of different workers. And then we measure how many nodes did it take, right? And, and the application is auto-scaling, um, you know, through HPA. But then we measure how many nodes did it take to do that workload, and we can, and that helps us identify some kind of performance regression. And performance regressions are also quite often cost regressions, right? Because if you're suddenly needing to use more nodes to do the same workload, it's going to cost you more. So, uh, so that's another technique that we've used to identify and to compare, um, you know, compare different releases. We've also used that to compare different processor types. So uh, you might be thinking about using Graviton, ARM processor machines, or maybe Intel or AMD. Um, and I think based on my experience, there's no silver bullet to say, oh, this processor type is always going to be 100% better for all applications. Uh, it really depends on each individual application. Uh, so it seems like a little bit of a cop-out answer, but you do need to test, you do need to measure, and those are the kinds of ways you can, you know, by, by running this type of, uh, you know, stress workload, you can uh, identify that. Make a small change, you know, change the processor type of the node, rerun the test, and then see if you're using a net, you know, for the same amount of uh, uh, work processed if you're, if you're using more nodes or less. Um, any other... Thoughts about designing? You know, how I think uh, to say uh, like uh, it goes back. I think about carefully what you're measuring, right? And um, that you know, you when you initially measure workload, maybe the utilization looks great, and then the app developer spends a, a month 
optimizing all their code and now their utilization looks a lot less good and are things, does your bad dashboard say things are better now or worse now? Because you don't want them to say they're worse. Um, so thinking about the holistic picture is always important. Great. Yeah, I think it's uh, obviously as platform engineers, you don't have visibility into inner workings of the of the applications that are running uh, on Kubernetes oftentimes. Uh, so it's really a partnership if, if you're working in a platform team along with the development teams that are using that platform. Uh, so you have to form good partnerships and uh, and see, and I see that we're running close on time. We did want to leave some time for questions, uh, but just wanted to summarize uh, some key takeaways. Uh, we have uh, the three pillars of platform efficiency that we talked about. We have uh, culture as uh, different uh, different things here you can see on the screen, uh, operations, and design. So hope that gives you a good framework. Uh, to think about cost optimization and how you can uh, do more with less. Uh, so with that, we'll open up to any questions. Oh, sorry, one last thing. I have to do a quick pitch on, oh, people are still taking pictures. Uh, but uh, I'll, show, I'll show that list uh, again. Uh, also would encourage you to scan this QR code, uh, sign up for the end user meeting. Uh, every other week we do this, almost the same kind of conversation that you just saw here. Uh, so if you're a CNCF end user member, you're, it's, a, it's a free opportunity to join and learn and, and share. So. Uh, so with that, we'll open up the mic for any questions. Thank you. All right. Oh, no, there. So my question would be, um, have, uh, so these institutions where you come from are quite big. So have you ever worked with spot instances on production? So have any of us worked on smaller companies? Because we're all relatively large companies. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, we um, do have a healthy usage of spot instances at Zalando. Um, we run all our test clusters on Spot, and we have also introduced a way to opt into using Spot instances uh, for the production as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's a great benefit. You save about 70% of the cost. Um, and for the workloads where you, you know, you, where you could tolerate uh, downtime, then it's, it's obviously a great choice. Question over there? Yeah. Um, well, um, Thanks for the talk, first of all. Uh, very interesting. Thanks for that again. Um, so I tried to convince um, my colleagues, my developing colleagues, hey, could you optimize this and that? And I heard you had the same problem. I say, hey, we are paid to build features, not to optimize stuff. Um, is there any recommendation besides showing up the cost of what an individual unit, app, whatever does? Um, to actually convince people that it's worth investing their time into optimization. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, it, it goes to your company's bottom line, right? So if if uh, you have if you have more if you're spending too much on infrastructure and cloud, that means you have less money to spend on hiring, you know, more developers or doing other you know doing other useful work for your company. So I think, you know, that part. Uh, should make sense to people that it, it, you know we can do more if we can if we can save on this cost we can do we can use that same money elsewhere in the organization uh, and also I think uh, but it's it's you're right it's difficult to to balance feature development with cost optimization and so I think when you're doing these things you need to approach it as a something that you put in the backlog and you take up as a normal part of of work not. Uh, something like coming from the side and changing all the priorities. You need to plan it as part of your roadmap to make these improvements and work on it incrementally. Uh, 
So. Yeah, and the other pitch is like uh, engineers take pride in building scalable and performant systems, right? So scalability, performance are all like good things and everybody takes pride. And similarly, I think it's important to take pride in building cost efficient systems and you know, what is the unit cost per transaction or per thing my application is doing. So I think uh, starting that conversation within the company and say like we as a team, we take pride in, in making and building and operating efficient services is another uh, good way to encourage that. Yeah, that's a good point, especially if you have a dashboard that's showing the cost, you know, engineers can take pride in like, okay, we, last month it was this, this month it's that, I can see a difference, right? You can really see the work that you do making a difference in the cost. So yeah, good yeah. luck. Thanks. Like one, one framing might be when, right? Like instead of saying, do we do this at all? It's like, when do we do this? Is it never, right? And when probably isn't like when it's way too late, you know? <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Oh. We have a question on this side? Yeah, so my question basically is, <clears throat> you spoke about the uh, cooperation between the application teams and the platform team, okay? so. Generally, who realizes the responsibility for for the real cost? Like, should I the application team? Should the platform team just mirror the cost and saying the different teams has this cost per services? How who is who is the responsible for deciding that a certain service is costly more than any other services and they should reduce it? Is the application teams themselves? It's difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to business value and what is your ROI. You know, so if you have a service that is generating a lot of revenue, obviously that's, you know, that's allowed to spend more money probably than something that's not, you know, not as important. Um, but not, not all critical services generate revenue directly, right? There's, so it's, it's difficult to really, you know, pin a number on something and, and to know, but it's uh, something that you have to arrive with, with a consensus between business and engineering. Uh, so with that, I think we, we're out of time for questions, but we'll stick around and uh, you know, feel free to come up and talk to us up at the front. Thank you, everyone.